This is the Montana Ministry Network podcast featuring guest speaker Tim Enlow from our 2022 family camp. Visit www.montanaministrynetwork.com for more information about the Montana Ministry Network. Tim, if you would come, we want to introduce to you uh, Tim Enlow, his wife Rochelle, and uh, he'll he'll introduce her in a moment. But uh, comes to us from Kansas, and so understands tornadoes and Dorothy and all that. No, yeah. Anyway, and uh, with that, I'll let him introduce himself from there. So, Tim, take us to the Word tonight, and uh, let's let's meet Jesus. Hey, good evening. That is the greatest introduction of all times right there. Uh, It is such a joy to be with you, and we're looking forward to a great time together at family camp in God's presence. And uh, it has been um, nearly 30 years since I stood on this platform, so that's a long time ago because it's taken that long for the ban of our ministry in this district to finally... No, I'm teasing. All right, so um, (laughs) it was our joy many, many years ago to, uh, to... When we were... Actually, before Rochelle and I were married, when we were engaged... Uh, a great man by the name of Keith Elder invited us to come and, and uh, share in the mornings in, in youth camp. We were just getting started and just love those days so much. But, honey, would you stand up and give a wave and a cartwheel? Um, Rochelle and I, Rochelle and I have been traveling now for almost 30 years teaching on the Holy Spirit, and uh, it is just such a privilege to be able to be in family camp. We love, we love being at camps with great communities, and I see some familiar faces. I see some Bartels in the back there. I see the pirate Bartell and the Sagu Bartell. So uh, remember R, remember? Oh, yeah, <laughs> all right. But uh, it is so good to see uh, some familiar faces. In fact, would you guys mind putting the picture of our family up on the screen? So this is our crew. Rochelle and I have three adult sons. Um, on the far left is our oldest son, Braden, and his wife, Olivia. And Braden is the assistant pastor at a great Assemblies of God church um, in Columbus, Ohio, uh, Radiant Life. And his wife, Olivia, is a licensed uh, professional Christian counselor. And then on the right um, is our middle son, Dolan, and actually our son, Braden, had Dr. Bartell at Sagu. So there we go, yeah. Uh, And then on the right is our middle son, Dolan, and his wife, Isabel, and she is the worship pastor, and Dolan is the youth pastor at a great AG church just on the north side of Austin, Texas, Round Rock. And then in the middle is our youngest son, Barrett, who is, I think, right now leading worship or maybe wrong time zone, but leading worship at uh, youth camp in North Texas. He's a sophomore junior at Sagu now, and he's leading one of their summer worship teams. So that's our crew. We started out, um, raised our kids on the road every year. We do, it depends on the year, uh, 275 to 300 services a year, and just so thrilled to be in Montana in Huckleberry Country, and God gave us some sunshine this week. How many are thankful for that, right? And uh, so we're looking forward, looking forward to that. So let me give you a quick heads up on where I believe the Lord has us heading. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking, um, uh, every night we're we're going to be focusing in on the Holy Spirit in different dimensions, but tonight we're going to be looking about our personal openness to the Holy Spirit. Uh, tomorrow night we're going to be focusing on, on baptism in the Holy Spirit, and for those of you that have already been baptized in the Spirit, stay home, sleep in, watch Netflix on the bad internet, and uh, uh, no, to, if, if you have already been baptized in the Spirit, i got to be honest with you, I know it's not Sunday and you don't have to be honest until Sunday, but um, i got to be honest with you, I have found that the majority, and this is a massive statement, but the majority of American and particularly Western North American Pentecostals don't get what the Global South Pentecostals get, and that is that we kind of view spirit baptism as just an augmentation, a benefit in our own personal life, like, ah, you get a little more power, God puts an extra shot in your spiritual latte, you know, and whatever. But how many know God really baptizes us in the Holy Spirit so we can do his ministry with supernatural tools? I mean, we know that theoretically, but tomorrow we're going to be looking at how when we're being baptized in the Holy Spirit in that process, and then of course afterwards, how Jesus is mentoring us to find the Spirit's prompting and follow those promptings in the days afterwards. And there are some of you that tomorrow night, even though you've been baptized in the Spirit since Noah and and his wife's engagement party, 
you're going to find that God's going to connect some things and just kind of click some things in your heart, and you're going to start hearing the Holy Spirit better than you've ever heard him. And if you're hungry to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, this is the place. We're believing uh, in these next uh, several days that God's just going to baptize a boatload of people in the Holy Spirit, and we're believing God for good things in that way. Um, And then, what is Sunday morning? Uh, Sunday morning's just drivel. Uh, it's going to be awful. Uh, don't miss that. No, Sunday morning, we're going to be looking at the context of Pentecost from the Old Testament, the New Testament, the modern Pentecostal movement, what the Lord is doing today, and just kind of doing a broad overview of that to kind of, because a lot of times we use these words and we miss the deeper meaning of the label. And then on Sunday night, uh, we're going to have a great time of looking on how to pray for others to receive healing. And we're having a great time of healing prayer. And then after that, I'm just the warm-up man. After that, then Rod Whitlock comes, and he's going to bring you the main chorus. We love the Whitlocks. And have they been here before? Oh, yeah. So you're going to love what they bring. So anyway, that's the whole story, all right? So there's all the announcements. Oh, yeah, clean up after your pet and all that stuff. Um, So we're going to dive into the Word of God in just a quick second. I should mention straight back in the auditorium, we have some of our most recent books. People typically ask two questions. What's the newest book? It's this one, Goodbye Chicken, Hello Dove, and it will be a blessing in your life. Um, And then they also ask, what's the deal in the kids' books? We have a children's book back there uh, that we wrote many years ago when our kids were little, and it was our own personal project on, we wanted our kids to be baptized in the Spirit at the earliest possible age, but yet at the moment when they understood it and they could really apply it to their lives. How many know we indeed uh, believe that the sign confirming sign of the baptism in the Spirit is that supernatural language of tongues, right? But how many know the baptism in the Spirit's a lot bigger than just the sign? And so I wanted our kids not merely to get to the spot where they could speak in tongues. I wanted them to understand this overwhelming anointing that God was imparting upon their lives. And so that book, Rashawn and I worked for several um, months on trying to teach our kids what baptism in the Spirit was and what to do with it afterwards, how these factors put into place. And so when, after our kids had received baptism in the Spirit, we just took the notes that we walked them through and, and created that book. And God has used that mightily. Actually, someone came up to us tonight and said, hey, a pastor from Washington, hey, uh, we use that book with our kids and stuff. But anyway, it's, it's a, there's other resources back there. There'll be a blessing. And there's our prayer cards back there too, which also double as coasters. So take advantage of all of that stuff. All right. So tonight our theme is on embracing the Holy Spirit. How many of you are huggers? How many of you are like, you keep your greasy arms to yourself, right? You know what it's like to be at a family dinner or something when, uh, you know, You've got, depending on the relative uh, and your history and their uh, criminal record, you have a, a lot of times a different, a different posture of reception. You know, there's some you're just like wide, oh, come here. And then there's others you always keep a piece of furniture between you and them. I remember uh, I grew up, my parents were in the ministry, and, and uh, growing up with my dad um, in traveling ministry, he taught me that whenever you see someone come in like a little too eager to hug you or really stinky breath or whatever you could just tell from a distance, usually you can see the cloud, he taught me a little slight adjustment in a handshake, and I'm going to give it to you tonight so you can know this is a gift from the Lord, that when they go to shake a hand and you're not quite sure of the person, if you just turn your elbow in like this, now there's always a steel girder between you and that person. You can't get pulled in for a hug. It's just a six-inch adjustment right there. That would change your life right there. Um, but, um, like, when I think of... A, a no barriers, wide open acceptance angle hug, I think of my two grandmothers. Um, and probably more my maternal grandmother, um, Grandma Enlo, because she was like Southern Illinois, homespun, had a little bit of a Southern accent, and, you know, every sentence began with hun, and, you know, this kind of stuff. My mom's mom, she was, you know, Northern Jersey, suburb of New York City, and she was just a little more direct, and she would give you the what for, good hugs too. But when I think of my, my Southern Illinois grandma, Grandma Enlo, I can actually help you experience her, if you just close your eyes for a moment, you get in your mind, in in your olfactory memory here, the smell of maybe a little mingled homemade fried chicken with some apple cobbler, that smell mingled, you got it? 
and then add on top of that a layer of Aquanet hairspray. Um, that's kind of what it was like. And my grandma Enla was covered in like two inches of Tempur-Pedic foam. So when she'd hug you, you would just like sink in and you could just feel your problems melt away. How many know what I'm talking about? Maybe you have a similar experience, unless your grandmother was a hell's angel. But um, it, that was kind of, kind of the way it was. And, and I think about that, just like no resistance. You know, this is kind of symptomatic and parallel to our own personal postures of acceptance and welcoming the Holy Spirit. We typically base these acceptance postures upon our own personal worldview, interactions, ideas, fears. And there are probably some of you that were raised in a super healthy Pentecostal environment that literally go, oh, Holy Spirit stuff, great. I mean, right away, you're like, I'll be there early. Let's sign me up. Crash helmet on, seatbelt on, I'm ready to go, you know. And then maybe there are some that maybe you come from a different Christian faith background where maybe the Holy Spirit wasn't talked about or he was functionally booted out of the Trinity and he was there just kind of a placeholder only. Or maybe you were maybe even on the other side where you were taught the Holy Spirit wasn't to be trusted and even feared. And it's interesting because I, I even hear occasionally, thankfully, the um, within the uh, American evangelical scene, the, the Christians, born-again believers, brothers and sisters, but they believe that the Holy Spirit no longer operates in this power, that his gifts ceased after the writing of the Scriptures. Though it, 25 years ago was the majority of American Christians, now it has become the smaller side, not quite a minority, but pretty close. And it's interesting. I'm not saying, hey, praise God, we won, but it is interesting that a dynamic Christian life tends to teach you to incrementally open up to the things of God and you begin to experience him in greater ways. And so when we think about embracing the Holy Spirit, this, this kind of brings us to the last teaching discourse of Jesus. Now, how many of you have ever gone away for like vacation or maybe even this week and you have a neighbor or a relative or a friend watching your place and you give them the rundown. There's like three things you need to know. Uh, garbage night is Tuesday. Would you mind putting the can out, you know? Um, don't forget to feed the dog, and don't forget to euthanize the cat. You give them those three instructions, and uh, these things are really important. Take care of that before we get home. This is the same sort of a thing that's going on. The moment Jesus broke the bread with them, the stopwatch, the countdown stopwatch began to tick. And it was just later on that night they were going to share the meal. He was going to teach this John 14 through 16 Last Supper discourse teaching. Then afterwards he would go to the garden where he would uh, be arrested after a season of prayer. And he would have his illegal night trial and then the next day uh, crucified and then in the tomb on Saturday resurrected Easter Sunday. And then over the next 40 days he would just make... Uh, occasional cameo appearances to the disciples and to other believers, over 500 witnesses, as Luke said, giving many convincing proofs he's alive. And then he'd ascend from the Mount of Olives and back to heaven. And th this was just marking, it's like his urgent, right before he's getting ready to go, he's giving them the list. And you would think Jesus would say, hey, here's the most important things. You all need to register for this political party. You know, you need to make sure you join this church. You need to make sure, ladies, your shorts are two inches below your kneecap. Men, your hair is trimmed over your ears because we all know if there's hair in your ears, there's sin in your heart, you know. And so, or whatever it might be, you know, we think that he would come and that he would give them some sort of new version of the Ten Commandments of the externalized way of pleasing God without really having relationship with him. But instead, he spoke all about relationship. There's three basic segments. It's kind of like an Oreo cookie. The beginning and the end of that teaching is all about the Holy Spirit, and the central part is about abiding in him. And it's interesting as you go through this portion, he's actually giving a lot of transfer language in this portion, John 14 and 16 particularly. He's vouching for the Holy Spirit, and he's saying the same kind of trust, the same kind of dependence you've had upon me from this day forward, 
Place that on the Holy Spirit. You can trust him. If you trust me, trust him. I'm vouching for you. I took you this far. He's going to take you the rest of the way. And this kind of transfer language is, is uncomfortable to some people because they say, hey, wait a minute. We're not supposed to trust Jesus anymore? Of course not. Of course we are. Of course not to the statement, and we are to trust him. But um, it, it, he's not telling them to stop trusting Jesus He's telling them the way through which we are to trust and experience Jesus in his physical bodily absence from the earth. And so I want us just to to do something together. How many like to burn a few calories tonight, like to lose a little weight, right? You got to make room for that huckleberry pie. So do me a favor, stand with me to your feet in honor of the reading of God's word. You'll get to burn about two and a half calories. And we're going to read together. We're not going to read all of John 14 and the end of 15 and 16. But I've just chosen a, a segment of verses that gives us an overview, and they feature the five major points that Jesus makes about the Holy Spirit to enable and to welcome the disciples to more warmly embrace him. And so we're going to read the word of God out loud together. Give it your best voice. This will be the best thing you hear all night. How many think it's okay if you read the Bible in church, right? And so let's read it. Let's get it in our eyes and our coconut and our ears and our mouths. Get it in our hearts. How many can raise a hand of affirmation saying the word of God has thus far changed your life? Yeah? All right. Let's read this together. Some of the highlights of Christ's teaching from the Last Supper. If you love me... Obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. I am telling you these things now while I am still with you, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. But I will send you the advocate, the Spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. There is so much more I want to tell you now, but you can't bear it. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for preserving it throughout the ages. So we always have access to an external auditor on our thoughts and ideas and pursuit and doctrine. And I pray tonight, Lord, that your word would change and conform our thinking and our goals and our pursuits and our actions in a greater way tonight. We choose to submit ourselves to your word. After all, this is Glacier Bible Camp. And Lord, I pray that your word would change us to be less like ourselves and more like Jesus. And Lord, trying our best to follow your perfect example on earth, where you taught about the kingdom and healed the sick hand in hand in almost every ministry opportunity, I pray today that you would come alongside the teaching of your word and that you would heal the sick Lord, mark these days with incredible life-transforming healings, like I don't need dialysis anymore healings, Lord Jesus, big things that shape and change the way we live for your glory. We thank you, God, for it. And finally, Lord, we just pray that across the road, Lord, and the children's ministry, Lord, and the elementary and the preschool, God, that you would so mark our children and grandchildren, 
Lord, that you would speak to them, that they would hear your voice, that they would be Pentecostal version 2.0, more filled with the Spirit than any of us have ever dreamt of being, Lord. World shakers and changers, God, raise up missionaries out of these kids. Speak to them. Help them to understand naturally the things of your Spirit. Thank you for helping us, Lord. Amen. Amen. You can be seated if you like. If you're a Dallas Cowboys fan, you are dismissed from the premises. So let's, uh, let's talk about a couple of things. First of all, um, so tonight I, I use the New Living Translation, which is actually a wonderful translation of the Bible. Um, I use that. I typically, I'm an NASB guy because I'm kind of a geek. But um, I use it tonight because this particular passage has a little bit of a, what has become a pesky word for some. In this version, it's translated as advocate. Now, I was born and raised in Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, First Assembly of God. It was my home church growing up. My pastor was a good Italian, Bongiorno, and he was actually literally ex-mafia. True story, he got saved out of the mafia. And so we always like to say we didn't have a lot of church problems, but we had a lot of missing deacons over the years. But no, a tremendous man of God, just, just uh, turned 90 years old, and, and a wonderful environment, and, and I'm thankful for that. But growing up, all of, still to this day, 99% of my Bible memorization is King James, which is a, an accurate, excellent translation of the Bible. However, a lot of people find an intellectual and cultural barrier to it because it uses kind of archaic language. Once you understand the code of the King James, um, you know, like what the word substitutions are, then it's typically not so much of a problem. If you're familiar with the King James Version, what is the word that you wanted to say when the word advocate kept on coming on the screen? What was the word? comforter, right? Now, how many know words change? The semantic range of words kind of morphs over the years. And today, if outside of church you use the word comforter, what do you think about? A big warm blanket on a winter's night. And that's not what Jesus is saying. I mean, maybe in some extreme edge of a metaphor, maybe sort of, kind of, probably not. Um, if you look at some of the other translations, I think NIV uses the word counselor, which is Pretty, pretty good um, going to the original word. Some, words, some Bibles use words like helper, which is pretty squishy. It's a very vague um, and probably not its most accurate sense. And then some translations use the word friend. The word used here is not friend. It's the word parakletos or paraclete. And it's actually preceded by the word alos, alos parakletos in the Greek. Now, you don't need to understand Greek to go to heaven, but the spiritual people do know the meaning of baklava. How many know that word meaning? <laughs> That'll change. When Jesus said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven, it's not that, but I wish it was. And so it could be that fry bread from down. Oh, man, a lot. how many had that fry bread from that barbecue place here? That'll change your life. I'm telling you what. It just lodges right in your aorta, but it's worth it. Some things are worth it. So the words alos parakletos, alos is a, a Greek word for another, but it's specifically another of the same kind. So basically you have alos and heteros. Alos is another of the same kind. Heteros is another of a different kind. Like it, you're sitting, you're, all these uniform chairs, they're all the same. Here's a chair, here's another identical chair, here's another, that's alos. If it was here's a chair, here's a bar stool, here's a lazy boy, here's a dining room chair, you know, that would be heteros, another of a different kind, basically. So he starts off with, I'm going to send you another of the same kind, parakletos. Parakletos or paraklete, para, the prefix, alongside, like parallel lines. And then the root word is a verb, kaleo, to call for assistance or for help. Jesus is saying, I'm going to send you another one just like me who is going to stand alongside you and be available to you to assist and help you. But the root of that kaleo idea is not so much in, in, in context, it's not so much like, hey, come and help me shovel a ditch. I mean, I can do it, but, you know, come and do it for me. But it's kind of like 911 or break glass, you know, grab help or like what do you who do you call when you need help and you're you're underwater you got the head gasket off and you dropped a bolt down you know and what do, what do you do who do you call well you probably go to youtube which isn't really uh, but it's interesting cuz like youtube it changed your life won't it like huh you know i've never thought of doing surgery but after watching that video I got a Swiss Army knife and I spray some chloroseptic on it to numb it. It's just an idea, you know. Don't go do that, but just. 
But who do you call? You call someone that you know has the answer or the wisdom in that specific area to help you. This is the idea. Jesus is saying, because remember, Jesus was the rabbi or the teacher. This is a cultural thing, first century Judaism, actually preceding that intertestamental history development, where a rabbi or a teacher of of Jewish culture and specifically uh, Jewish religion would find some of the best and brightest and he would say, basically invite them, come follow me and I'll mentor you basically. You would be my disciple, my student. And so this is kind of the idea. Jesus is saying, just like I've mentored you, I've been your Mr. Miyagi, so to speak. Um, Just like I've mentored you, I'm getting ready to go, but the Holy Spirit is going to come and seamlessly continue my ministry to you. He is going to be another one of the same kind who's going to stand alongside you and help you. So just a little understanding on some of the language. Let's look real quick deeper and and let's dive into these five major themes, truths that Jesus uh, opens up so we can more warmly embrace the Holy Spirit. If he gave it to the disciples and invited them to more warmly embrace the Holy Spirit, how much more do we need to warmly embrace the Spirit? Let's look at the first. First of all, the Holy Spirit is divine. Now, often when you say divine, like the modern usage of the word is, it's like a compliment for food. Honey, the beanie weenie was divine tonight, you know? It's like saying, you know, that's really great. But When we say divine, we're saying literally and unapologetically, the Holy Spirit is God. We make no apologies. We're not Jehovah's Witnesses that say, uh, you know, Neo-Aryans that say the Holy Spirit is some impersonal force of God or it's his lightning that comes out of his Sith Lord fingers or something like that. We intentionally say the Holy Spirit is God. In fact, if you want to jot this down in the back of your eyelids, the seven-word definition for the identity of the Holy Spirit is simply this. The Holy Spirit is God's personal spirit. When we think of the Holy Spirit, we're not thinking of someone else outside of the being of God. It's not like the the runner-up in the Miss America pageant who's generally not the winner unless the winner does something wrong, you know. It's not like that. The Holy Spirit is God's personal spirit. And you'll notice, uh, maybe you did in some of our reading of these scriptures, all of these Trinitarian references. So here's Trinity or Godhead in a nutshell, all right? So... um, The Bible never uses the word Trinity or or Godhead. Those words were invented later on by theologians to try to label uh, an issue from the Scripture that helps us understand the nature of God. But here it is in two simple steps. Step number one, Christians have and serve and believe in one God, the creator God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, The best of our ability, we understand his most clear Hebrew name to be Yahweh. You've heard that before. A lot of people are singing that in a song. They're going, what is that? It's like, hey, 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 you know, in a worship song, um, like Yahweh, you know, whatever. But that is simply um, the Hebrew pronunciation for his name. Earlier on, with some misunderstanding of translation, um, they substituted some of the vowels and came up with the idea of Jehovah. Jehovah is a mispronunciation of Yahweh. Don't stop calling him that. He's been called worse. He he gets all of his mail. It all goes straight to him. But Yahweh would be the best understanding of his name. Fact number one, Christians serve one God. Fact number two is subordinate to fact number one. But fact number two is even though God is one being, one substance, one entity, with, because he is so much vastly superior, greater than we are, within his one being are the three forever distinct persons of the Godhead or Trinity, God the Father, God the Son or Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. In fact, when you read the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John is Trinity central. I mean, you, it's really difficult to get out of the Gospel of John and not believe that God is one God with three per. I muted myself there. I must have been heretical. Um, so Freudian mute. All right. So check check this out. Just look at some of these. So look for Trinity in these language. Uh, go back, please, if you would. Look for Trinity in these. Jesus says, "I will ask the Father. I, Jesus, will ask the Father, and He will give you another Advocate. That's Allos Parakletos, referring to the Spirit." Later on, he says, the Father sends the advocate, the Spirit, as my, Jesus' representative. 
Interesting, you'll see this, it's just replete through the Gospel of John and elsewhere, and of course, the Apostle Paul is super strong in this too, but John is really the epicenter for all of this, even in, in actually in all of his books, but the Gospel of John is, has the biggest amount of data on this. Now, in the Bible, there are 16 major labels or names for the Holy Spirit, and these reveal his divinity too. Hit me with the next one, if you would. Here's the first eight, and the scripture reference on the right is just the first time that's given. Of interest, you'll notice the second verse of the Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit hovering, moving over the formless world. And then you go down, you can notice in Joel chapter 2, God calls the Holy Spirit my spirit. That's very, very significant. Uh, Jesus calling him the spirit of truth. And I love Paul's reference in Acts 16, the spirit of Jesus. Really, really cool. Uh, go to the next one. Everyone done with your pictures? I smile. Okay. Everyone done? All right. Okay. Uh, go to the next one, please. And so life-giving spirit, you know, the, all the Roman stuff. Of course, Romans 8 is the one chapter in the Bible with the most references to the Holy Spirit. Uh, Paul's great thesis on that. Um, the spirit of his son, reflecting back on the spirit of Jesus stuff. And then I like the last one in Revelation 1, 4, the sevenfold spirit. This does not mean that the Holy Spirit has seven faces or seven personalities or people try to label all these things. That's not what that means. This is just a cultural way at the time of saying the Holy Spirit is complete and lacks nothing. So entirely sufficient and complete. That's the kind of advocate the Holy Spirit has left for us, or Jesus has left for us, rather. The Holy Spirit is divine. Secondly, check out this. The Holy Spirit is not only divine, but he is, because I forgot my point. Trustworthy. All right. So um, people ask how I preach without notes. It's because I have really severe dyslexia and notes really mess me up. But I'm a decent memorizer, so I memorize an acronym, but I just forgot it. So there you go. All right. So he's trustworthy. Now, this is actually a major sub-theme that's running through this text. Jesus is trying to, you hear all this transfer language. He's trying to say the same way you trusted me, trust the Holy Spirit. I brought you this far. He's going to take you the rest of the way. Listen to the pleading in his voice and the strong statements he's making. It's like he's writing uh, the recommendation of a book or something for the Holy Spirit or like a job description recommendation. Hire the Holy Spirit. He'll, he'll, you know. He, the Spirit, will teach you what? Everything. That's a pretty good recommendation. And will remind you of everything I, Jesus, have told you. Jesus is saying, He's not only going to take you the rest of the way, but he's going to preserve what I have thus far imparted into your life. This is a massive, massive statement of trustworthiness. Then Jesus says, I am sending you the advocate, and he is the spirit of what? Truth. Jesus, who self-professed to be the way, the truth, and the life, this is the spirit of truth, and he's going to come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. Again, replete with Trinitarian language and Boy, that verse started a fight in the early church, Filioque and all that stuff. He's trustworthy. Now, how many of you trust Jesus? But it, it's a little difficult sometimes for us to trust the Holy Spirit because we've heard about what he does to people. It was actually here at Glacier Bible Camp in the early days. I believe they had a tent set up here first for the first couple of years. And it was at that tent there was a lady from Missoula named Ethel. And I don't know if this story has gotten lost, but it's recorded. And the power of God hit her at the altar, and there was suddenly a bright flash of light and the smell of fried bologna, a puff of smoke, and all that was left of here was some melted high eels and the sawdust. We ain't seen her since, you know. No, it's not true. But a lot of people are afraid. Um, a lot of people are afraid that if they really open up to the Holy Spirit, like there's a safety net around Jesus. There's a safety net around the Father, but there's no safety net around the Holy Spirit. Like you can easy to fall off the edge. And a lot of people think if they open up to the Holy Spirit that they have to throw all discernment out of the window, but that's not the way at all. Matter of fact, one of the most significant spiritual gifts the Holy Spirit gives is discerning of spirits, you know? And a lot of people think, well, if I open up to the Holy Spirit, then I've got to be weird, and I've got to go for all the crazy things, and I've got to believe everything that's taught from Tulsa and everything on TBN, and I've got to, you know, go get a golden spleen at a conference or whatever like that. And a lot of people just think that if, if they open up the Spirit, that they have to lose all safety net. The safety net is the Word of God, who, by the way, the Holy Spirit wrote, 2 Peter 1.21, right? 
And so he's trustworthy. There's no fear. In fact, the true fear should be in a Christian who does not open up and embrace the Holy Spirit. Now, that's something to be feared. Number three, the Holy Spirit is not only trustworthy, he's recognizable. This is a huge principle. Um, Jesus says, he identifies the advocate, another advocate just like me. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world, the lost, cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. This Last Supper discourse is at the feathered edges of the Old and New Covenant. I mean, yeah, there is a hard stop and a fresh start with the resurrection of Jesus, but this is really in those feathered edges that's going on here. So at this point, under the Old Testament theological banner, followers of God, followers of Yahweh, did not have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. The Holy Spirit was with them in the covenant family of God, but he didn't live inside of them. That's why they needed a temple. You had to go to where, you know, that sort of an idea. But Ezekiel prophesied that one day in the new covenant, God was going to put a new heart and his spirit to live inside of us. Many other references, but Ezekiel 36 is one of the anchor points there. And Jesus says to them now, because they're still kind of teetering on the edge of the old covenant, he's with you now, but in a little while he'll be in you. And we read about this in John 20, the first post-resurrection appearance of Jesus to the disciples behind the locked doors when he breathed on them and the Holy Spirit came to live inside of them. Emphuseo in the Greek, it's not emphysema, but emphuseo, he came came to live inside of them. The tense is it happened at that moment. We as Pentecostals tend to overly Pentecostalize every reference on the Holy Spirit. That John 20 reference is a regeneration, salvation. The Holy Spirit came to live inside of them, Scripture, you know. But how many know as Christians the Holy Spirit lives in all of us from the moment of our salvation onward? He would only leave. He's even there when you don't feel him. How many know the Bible says he sees you when you're sleeping? He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. Man, Glacier Bible Camp knows the word. So proud of you. Um, But no, he lives inside of us from the moment of salvation onward, even when you don't feel him. And the only way he would leave is if you would turn your back and walk away from Jesus or decisively evict Jesus from your life. Please don't do either of those. And none of us really know where that line is, do we? We're not exactly sure of, you know, is it 56 in a 55-mile-an-hour zone, or does God give you three over? But it does stir our hearts to say, I just don't want to be anywhere near that line. I want to be as close to the Lord. How many of you just keep on wanting to grow closer to him? And so it's interesting. Jesus says he's going to be in you. Now, where all this comes from, the world cannot receive him because they aren't looking for him and can't recognize him. Now, how many of you sense the Lord's presence, the spirit of the Lord's presence today during worship? Some of you maybe even sense when you pulled in the parking lot with anticipation and you've had so many encounters with God here and fellowship and stuff. Now, when you sensed his presence tonight, if you sensed him during worship, when you sensed his presence, did you say, hey, wait a minute, who is this? Who am I feeling? Can I see license and registration, please? Holy Spirit, can I see your lanyard? No, because you immediately recognized him. This is a massive Massive principle in helping believers to more warmly embrace the Spirit. You know him without even caller ID. Right away, you knew when you sensed the Holy Spirit's breath, you knew right away who it was. You didn't say, hmm, I hope that's not a demon, I feel. You knew right away it was him because he has lived inside of you from the moment of salvation onward. He's the one that Paul says his spirit, capital S, joins with our spirit, lowercase s, to affirm or confirm that we belong to God. There's this sense of rightness. There's this interior resonance when you sense his presence or work or a good prophecy or you know, something going on. You sense this inside. You just know it's right. There's this discerning recognition that happens. This is massive. I always told our boys from the youngest days onward, if you love Jesus, you're praying, you're reading your Bible, trust your gut. And gut is not a technical term though I am developing mine. Go to the next one, please. So the Holy Spirit is not only recognizable, he's revelatory. 
And this word kind of scares people away because right away, people that are afraid you're going to fall, they oh, he's going to lead you outside of the Bible. No, he wrote the Bible. The Holy Spirit never leads us away from the things of Jesus. One of my dear friends, Gary Grogan, put it best. He said, the Holy Spirit leads in two directions only, deeper into Jesus and farther out into the lost world to fulfill the mission of Jesus. Very well said. Jesus says this. You can almost hear the tension in this statement. There is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. You need a lot more than I can download to you now. You're in trouble. You don't have the bandwidth. You don't have the hard drive. You can't handle the truth, you know. But then he goes on to say, you can almost hear the sigh in his voice, a resolution. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own or of his own initiative but will tell you what he has heard. What a curious statement. In other words, the Holy Spirit is not an origination voice. He is a repeater. That's intriguing. We'll pick that up in a moment. He will tell you about the future. Now, don't ask him for stock picks or lotto numbers. But how many can say, since you've served the Lord, that the Holy Spirit has guided and led you in different ways? Small things so you don't you know, marry an axe murderer or whatever. Um, but also on the big scale, even though we haven't been to heaven, occasionally God favors some Christian out of seeming obscurity and he beams them up to the mothership and gives them a carte blanche tour of heaven, lets them come back down and write a tell-all best-selling book. But probably not most of us. I've never had that. And so... Uh, but even though we've not been to heaven, how many have this inner knowing beyond even the small amount of facts that are described in the Scripture, and you know heaven is great. It's a whole lot better than, it's like Montana without taxes and mosquitoes, right? But that's demonstrating the revelatory nature of the Spirit, both in the small, he led me and guided me, helped me make that decision, helped me to, you know, but also on the big scale, my ultimate GPS coordinates are anchored in heaven. Even though I don't know the actual coordinates, I know the coordinates because the Spirit's revealed. Do you see how on that spectrum how he reveals to us? But beyond that, think about this. Every verb, and we didn't read all of them, but every verb Jesus gives about the Holy Spirit's ministry in John 14 to 16, they're all revelatory. Teach, lead, guide, direct, reveal, make known. He wants to reveal to us just like Jesus revealed the kingdom of God to the disciples when he walked with them on those dusty roads, now he's getting ready to go to heaven. He says the Holy Spirit is going to continue this revelatory ministry. Wow. Number five, finally, the Spirit is Jesus-focused. For many people that are uncomfortable to warmly embrace the Spirit because they're always concerned. I've heard, well, you know, you can trust the Father. After all, he has a throne, and that's legit. And uh, don't try to tell some Christians that God is spirit, even though the Bible does, because they if, imagine God is like this skinny Santa Claus with angry eyes, you know, sits on a throne, big beard, you know. And uh, you can trust Jesus, because after all, he became flesh and dwelt among us, so we could identify Emmanuel, God with us, incarnate, in, in flesh, you know. And also, aren't you glad that when Jesus was on earth and that three, three-and-a-half-year period of his ministry that he took so much time away from the crowd to, to sit for all those oil-painting portraits. I mean, they, I would have imagined him being looking more like a Middle Easterner, but who knew he looked like a jaundiced Scandinavian? Who knew that, you know? Um, but the Spirit is Jesus-focused. Could we go back one slide just for a quick moment to number four just for a quick second? Check out what... Um, what he says, uh, yeah, here. So here's this, here's this statement here. We'll go over here. All right. Here's this statement. So Jesus says, he the Spirit will not speak on his own or his own initiative, but will tell you what he has heard. Wouldn't that raise a question in your heart if you were a disciple? Well, who's he talking for? Now go to the next one, number five, please, our last one. Jesus explains, he the Spirit will bring me, Jesus, glory by telling you, Whatever he receives from me. 
A lot of people are afraid, well, if I really trust the Holy Spirit, he's going to lead me on some detour or some, you know, he's going to, you know, do this or do that. And, and those are just unfounded fears because, in essence, the Holy Spirit's ministry is a big red blinking arrow pointing to Jesus all the time. And technically, theologically, you could make a strong biblical argument for saying any time you have ever sensed the Holy Spirit's leading, guiding voice, actually what you've heard is the Holy Spirit communicate to you what Jesus was saying. He doesn't speak on his own initiative. He speaks what he has heard. And then my favorite verse in the Bible this one verse has means so much to me, and uh, I think in this one verse, you find out more about the nature of God than any other single verse in the Bible. All that belongs to the Father is mine, Jesus said. That is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. Now, this is entirely uh, inadequate, all right, so understand that. But when I read that verse, I just get this mental picture, and I know it's inadequate on, on many levels probably, but I get this picture in my mind of the person of the Father taking something that he wants to reveal and handing it to Jesus, who takes this thing that's been entrusted from the Father, who hands it to the Holy Spirit, who then hands it to me. Can you see what happens if you don't warmly embrace the Holy Spirit and you remove him out of that chain? All of a sudden, you miss so much. Again, an inadequate metaphor because you can never fully describe God in all of those ways. But what an interesting picture. Jesus saying, all that belongs to the Father is mine. That's why I said the Holy Spirit will take from what is mine and will make it known or reveal it to you. It's all focused in pointing back. Jesus is the focus. He's the epicenter. The Holy Spirit doesn't lead you away from Jesus. He leads you into Jesus. And if you plug your ears and go, la, 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 to the Holy Spirit, you're actually missing a revelation of Jesus in your life. The Holy Spirit sometimes reveals things in overtly dramatic and supernatural apparent ways, and, and sometimes he reveals things in just kind of casual inner nudges. How many know what the inner nudge is like? I mean, it's really cool, actually. In fact, I've found, and I don't know this to be a theological truth, uh, so, truth universally, so I'll step away from the pulpit, but I found the longer I've served the Lord, the more... The inner nudge is the way he leads me. Early on in my Christian walk, he kind of hit me with Jehovah Zappa and great balls of fire and all that stuff. But it seems most often for me, serving him all these years, it's like, like you get to know someone. You just know that look. You know, you know that, that, that cue and that relationship. You know what that means. And, and it kind of feels that way. And I'm, I'm not saying he couldn't send some great fireworks in the heaven. And I believe he will in a couple days on the 4th, actually. But... Um, but instead, I found him typically leading me gently. But I, I want to I want to wrap things up by just sharing this story. In the beginning of 2021, uh, we began our year of ministry in January there um, in the Cherokee Reservation in eastern Oklahoma. Matter of fact, we were in Salisaw this last week. Um, our home base is Wichita, Kansas, so it's not too far away, about five hours or so. And so we were in the Cherokee Reservation at the end. Our, our normal ministry is multi-churches coming together for like a weekend conference on the Holy Spirit. And so this was several churches together there on the reservation. It was really wonderful. And thank God, man, there are some of our Native American folks um, have some of the greatest spiritual openness I've ever been around. And like all of us, when that openness gets focused in on Jesus, look out, devil, Right? I mean, amazing, amazing. And we had had such a great week with so many people coming to Christ and being filled with the Spirit. I was so grateful to God. And so the last service, um, like we're doing this week, I ended actually um, with uh, functioned uh, and, and directed prayer for the sick around the altars. And at the end, then, we had people that had been healed to come up and give testimonies. And so there's like, I don't know, 15 or 16 of them. So I was going down the line with a microphone, Okay, what's your name? Where are you from? What happened to you? You know, I you know I used to have the third eye on my forehead. They prayed it went away. Whatever it was, I mean that's not a real testimony, but but they were all. Uh, I made sure that it wasn't just, you know, I can, you know, I I think some of my pain is better. It was either Jesus or the Tylenol I took before church. But either way, you know, not testimonies like that. It, they were strict. 
like something you couldn't do, you could do now. We had several people with deaf ears and blind eyes. It was wonderful, and Jesus only can do those things. But from the very first person, I began to experience this interior angst because I began to get this little revelation nugget from the Holy Spirit. If you're familiar with the nine manifestation gifts of the Spirit, probably likely a word of knowledge uh, where he just kind of gives you a little nugget piece, logos of of information, data, gnosis, you know, just a little, not enough to satisfy your curiosity, but enough to motivate you to obey the Lord and do something for him. And so right away, my inner Sherlock Holmes begins, it's one word, my inner Sherlock Holmes begins to try to solve the Rubik's Cube. And so I'm, I'm with one ear listening to the person trying to rejoice, and the people are clapping as I'm going to the next person and sharing, they're sharing their testimonies. And, but inside, I'm really wrestling, and about halfway through, I'm like, Lord, I can't respond to that because I felt like God just wanted me to say it out loud on the microphone. But I'm really struggling because it's so vague and so detached from context and everything. And I'm like, God, can you give me more? And keep on going down the line. I'm trying to stay engaged and people are clapping and whatever testimonies. But as it came down to like the second or the last person, I'm starting to pit my shirt out because I'm feeling like God wants me to say this out loud, but I still have no more context, no more understanding, and I'm not mentally comfortable with obeying this spiritual prompting, which is a very normal place to be, right? So like the second or last person, I'm like, Pat, can I buy a vowel? You know, I'm just trying to find any, any more clues I can find. So the very last person, they're winding up their testimony. The pastor is sitting over here. He's standing up walking towards me. I know I've got like 15 seconds before I hand him the mic and he sets the captives free. So as that last person is done, I say, hey, as pastor is coming, I've been really wrestling with this thing. How many would cut me some slack and give me some room to make a mistake? I just feel like I'm supposed to say this word out loud over the microphone. I don't know what it means, and if I'm wrong, I'll pray more. And they're like, yeah, whatever. So pastor's right here, and I go, here we go. Yellow. I handed him the mic, right? (laughs) He looks at me like, what have you just done to me, you know? Things were going well until now. And he goes, well, whatever that is, all right, God bless you. See you next week. He hits me in the arm. He goes, yellow, come on. I go, I'm sorry. To the best of my ability, I felt like I was supposed to do that. I've been wrong, and I still will most likely be wrong a lot in my life. But I just, and I'll pray more, send the hate email to me, and I'll, I'll apologize, and whatever. So, he goes, so we're talking to people, great pastor, by the way. And so as the place is kind of thinning out, he and I are walking down the aisle. We're still talking about this yellow business, you know. Um, he's like, what was that? The, you know, it's like uh, uh, Jeopardy. His line to me was like, Jeopardy, what is the color of Big Bird, you know. And anyway, but um, he's giving me all these Jeopardy questions out the, out the line, just ribbing me really hard. So as we walk out the door, this lady all of a sudden pops up. Their church was like theater seats. She pops up from underneath the theater seat. She was, looked like she was cleaning something. And she goes, hey, can I talk with you guys before you go? We're like, yeah, by that point we had already crossed into the lobby. So she just came into the lobby with us. And she first said, I'm so sorry. My daughter, Micaiah, was inconsolable tonight. And I said, honestly, I didn't know. I mean, you could have a parade come through, and when I'm preaching, I probably wouldn't notice it. And she goes, yeah. She goes, well, and she kind of choked up. She's special needs. She's really high on the autism spectrum. She's eight years old, and she's non-language, but she's very verbal. And tonight, we just couldn't console her and and she was throwing stuff. And, we, well, we brought, now she really starts choking up. We brought her to receive healing tonight. But she didn't make it. About halfway through the teaching, my husband looked at me. It was her mom and then the lady, the mom, and then Micaiah and then the dad. And she said, I, my husband turned to me and said, honey, this is not fair for her. She doesn't understand. We know there's no distance in prayer. We know God's given us a special, like a gift of faith to believe. We know that God's going to heal our daughter one day. He's promised that to us. We know that not only from the word, but our own interaction here in the Holy Spirit. And, and we know God's going to promise on her life. And let me take her home. I'll, we only, you know, live really close. As soon as I get home, I'll put the live stream on. When the healing prayer time comes, you and your mom agree in prayer. I'll lay hands on her and pray, and we're just going to believe God to do it because we know he's going to. And she goes, yeah, you're right. Go ahead and take her. It's not fair for her. But she said the moment my husband left with her, I began to get really nasty in my heart. Her actual word was acidic towards God. And she said, I just began to get super grouchy. She said pretty soon the healing prayer time started, and 
She said, I put my forearm on the theater seat in front of me, and out of emotional fatigue, my head just fell down my forehead on my forearm, and I just began to sulk. Seriously, Jesus, you couldn't have given Micaiah just a, a few more minutes of peace so she could have been in this service just a, just a little while longer? And then the healing testimony started, and she said, that was the icing on the cake for me. She's the very first person I said to myself, that should have been Micaiah. I should have been standing beside saying, telling the story, and then saying, listen, Micaiah, can you talk now? And then the next one, and the next one, she said, I just began to brew. How many know God already knows what you're thinking in your heart? So you might as well go ahead and say it. You remember the story of Jonah? You know, he already knows the end from the beginning, and you try to buy, you know, a ticket to Tarshish, and, and uh, you know the end of the story, you end up on Gumbo Beach, you know. And, um, and so I always wonder if Jonah could ever eat gumbo afterwards. I don't think he could. But um, so she said, I just began to, to talk, and she said, I said some really awful things to the Lord. She said, by the second to last person you were interviewing, the last one, she said, I was saying things like, God, do you even care about my daughter? Do you even love her? Do you even know her name? Do you know anything about her? Lord, you don't know, you don't even know what her favorite color is. Yellow immediately came over the PA system. And as she's crying, and we're starting to cry, she said, I realize, I know God's going to heal my daughter, but tonight God decided to heal me. I share that not to say, check out how great I am, because trust me, I was pitting out my shirt and afraid, like all of us are in those moments where the Holy Spirit's revelation is never enough to give us intellectual certainty, you know? but always enough for God to reveal his glory and the Holy Spirit to, by extension, allow our lives to be also a blinking neon arrow towards Jesus for someone else. But I share that with you because the potentials of opening up and embracing the Holy Spirit take us beyond what we can do for our, out of our own ability for the Lord, and they open up heaven's ability for us for Jesus to be glorified and other people to see his light and love and grace. I want to invite the worship team to come back up. And has anybody ever told you to go fly a kite? How many are sitting by someone you've always wanted to tell? No, don't raise your hand. Uh, what, is it, what does that normally mean, go fly a kite? It means, you know, get lost, get out of my face. It's kind of rude, right? But honestly, you know, teaching's all about metaphors. You learn that from the ministry of Jesus. And um, I've honestly never found a better metaphor for opening up to or embracing the Holy Spirit than flying a kite. You've, how many of you have actually flown a kite before? You've held the string, and okay, it's a pretty common experience. If you haven't, you need to go buy one. But um, the beginning of it, you have to put some effort and energy in. You've got to run. You've got to, you know, you've got to put some air in order to get some lift. You're creating the breeze by your running, right? But after you get a certain amount of altitude, 30, 40, 50 feet or whatever, then after that, it is entirely up to you as you stand stationary how much string you let out. It's all up to you. It's all up to your own personal level of how comfortable you feel. What keeps people from just letting a little string out typically is fear. And not all fears are bad. In fact, the Lord has a way of slowly, progressively, as his progressive works in our life, are kind of cooking fears out of us. But... It's all up to how much fear. I, did I tie the string on the end of the handle or the stick? I can't remember. Well, only one way to find out, you know. Or your fear might be, well, what if the string breaks? Or what if a big, you know, gust comes or a thermal comes and I'm too afraid to let go and I get carried off to the cosmos and they never see me again, you know. It's typically based on fear, but you can let out as much string as you want to. But when it comes to opening up to the Holy Spirit, Jesus lets us know there's the safety net of God all around everything the Holy Spirit does. We know his final intent is to glorify Jesus. He's entirely trustworthy. After all, Jesus vouched for him, right? If you trust Jesus, you can trust his Holy Spirit to take us the rest of the way. And I'm going to invite you to do something. Would you stand with me? Reach as high as you can up in the air. This is not a spiritual thing. This is just a stretch, all right? 
Now reach down as low as you can and put your hands on flat on the ground and then one foot straight up and then the other. No takers? Okay, all right. Go fly a kite. Come on, would you just begin to open up to the Holy Spirit right now? Maybe lift a hand and just out loud begin to verbalize a welcome to him. Come on, not a silent prayer in this room. If you pray silent, I pray your golf cart doesn't start, all right? Come on. That's what we're here for, isn't it? To encounter God. Let's do it. Come on. Just begin to send an invitation to him. Whether you have never felt closer to God or maybe right now you feel far from God, send the Holy Spirit an invitation. Come on, Holy Spirit, I need you. Thanks for living inside of me since the moment I was saved. Thank you for revealing Jesus in me. Thank you that I can feel and sense your presence so often. Come on, have you ever told the Holy Spirit that you trust him? We don't say that very often to anyone in this life. But would you tell it to the Holy Spirit? Spirit of Jesus, I trust you. Come on, tell him something else. Just let out a little more string, would you, right now? Maybe lift a hand an inch higher. Lift your voice a decibel louder. Oh, Holy Spirit, I need you. Would you take what is the master's and reveal it to me? I want to receive everything that you reveal. I want to lean in and listen to you. Teach me. Teach me how to hear your voice. Teach me how to follow. Be my rabbi. Be my teacher who teaches me everything and reveals all truth to me, reminds me of everything Jesus has said, and then takes me the rest of the way. Oh, I need you, Holy Spirit. Come on, if you've been afraid of him, tell him that. Ask him. Maybe you still have a little fear. That's all right. Just invite the Holy Spirit to allay or console your fears. Invite him to come and stand alongside you and be your mentor, your advocate. Come on, just let out a little more string, would you, just for a moment? Come, Holy Spirit, breathe upon us, I pray. Reveal Jesus. Let us see more than some inadequate oil painting. Reveal Jesus in us through your ministry. Open my life to you, Spirit of the Lord. I'm just going to open up these altars. If you want to spend a few moments beginning to open up to him, God has a lot for us this week, a lot for us. But if you'd like to come, I want to invite you to come to these altars. Just seek him for a few moments. While many are coming to seek the Lord and pray, I just want to grab the attention of those in this room that maybe you're not sure about your relationship with God, or maybe you know that you're far from Him. You knew it was inevitable that you would come to camp and God would grab a hold of you by the lapels and whisper words of love and invitation to you, and that's what He's doing right now by the Holy Spirit. And tonight, if you say, you know what, I know I'm living far from God right now, but I want to be close either for the first time in a relationship or I want to come back. I want you just to wave a hand at me wherever you're at. Say, that's me. I want to come home tonight. Yeah, God bless you. God bless you. Say, three, awesome. Man, I wonder how many thousands of people have given their lives to Christ on this property over the years. If you want to receive Christ or you want to give your life back to the Lord, if you know you've kind of fallen away from Him, I want to invite you, you're welcome to pray your own words as long as they're directed to Jesus and they're honest, they're perfect words of prayer. But if you're uncomfortable and are not really sure you're going to say the right thing, you could follow my words of prayer as a guide if you'd like, but feel free to go off script. But for the rest of us in this room, I want to invite you while I'm leading a sinner's prayer, instead of following my prayer, if you already know Jesus, would you pray a fresh prayer of repentance right where you're standing? Come on and lift it up to the Lord out loud. We've all sinned. We all need his help, right? So don't let pride mute your language of prayer.
Come on, let's call out to him. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is your one and only son and that no one else can save me from my sins but you, Lord Jesus. Wash me clean. Forgive me. Cleanse me. And allow your Holy Spirit to live inside of me from this day forward. I no longer belong to myself. I no longer belong to the enemy. But I belong to you, Lord Jesus. Not only my Savior, but my ruler, King, and Lord from this day forward. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's just fly our kites for a few moments. Spirit of the Lord, oh, I need you, I need you, I need you. Come and fill my heart, fill my life. Magnify Jesus, make him known. Thank you for listening to the Montana Ministry Network podcast. Visit us online at www.montanaministrynetwork.com.